Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm part of the teaching team here at CRB. It's awesome having you here. And I just want to say thank you for being you uh, because uh, this week I actually did a workshop, uh, a workshop I do every once in a while here in San Diego uh, for two days. It's called Strongness. And I had 52 people from all over the country uh, come to the workshop, and a couple of them emailed me last week, and they said, hey, Mike, we're coming in a couple days early, and we're, we're looking for a, a great church to, to try out and attend on Sunday. You got any uh, suggestions? I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Come to my church. Come to CRV. And so uh, they, uh, they came last Sunday, and they loved it. I, I, I met, I didn't know who these people were, by the way. I just uh, recommended it. I said, come to my church, come to CRB, you'll love it. It's amazing. They came, and then I, I met them on Monday, and literally the first thing out of their mouth was, we love your church. It's amazing. And I'm like, yes, it is. And then they, uh, <laughs> yes, give yourselves a hand. And then, uh, and uh, they, they said, we love that Jared guy. He's good. I'm like, yeah, I know. He's really good. They said, you know what? He looks like Mick Jagger. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. He does. He really does. And so uh, I love being a part of this church. I love this community. I love you guys. It is uh, so fun to just to to do this stuff together and figure out life and, and, and just explore all the promises of God and how good he is to us and to, to have friends come in from out of town and visit this place and, and just sense the, the beauty and the grace and the love in this house. So I just want to say thank you for just continuing to live your lives that way. And uh, by the way, if you're here for the first time, we're really glad you're here too. Um, I don't look like Mick Jagger. Uh, the guy who will be here next week does, but uh, we're glad you're here too. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about something that I think we all need, uh, something that is required if you want to uh, get through your day, your week, your month, even your year sometimes. And that idea is hope and grabbing on to hope. And because we live in a world right now where there's a lot of hopelessness, there's a lot of despair, there's a lot of stress and anxiety and fear. I mean, certainly at the macro level, things that are happening in different nations and wars and, and, and things that are happening in D.C. right now. There's a lot of uncertainty and politics and division and, and even in the economy, there's, there's talks of recession and is the stock market all gonna you know, do the same things that it's been doing the past 10 years. And there's like a lot of fear and, and uh, confusion and hopelessness infused into our daily lives. And we have to ask ourselves, like, how do we, how do we handle that? Certainly at the macro level. But then there's the micro level, kind of the personal level of where we need hope because a lot of us are going through seasons and maybe this has been a week for you. Like, I just want to forget this week happened. This was not a good week for me. Maybe there's a financial challenge. Maybe there's, there's some medical issues you're navigating right now. Maybe there's, there's some relationship stuff. I, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe job. And, and you're like, man, I need some hope right now. I need to know I'm going to be okay. I need to know that God's got this, that there's, there's somebody I can trust through, the, through this chaos and the storm of life because I... I'm kind of wondering if I'm going to get through this. I'm kind of wondering if I'm ever going to feel joy again. And so if that's you, and, and whether you're experiencing that right now, or you've had seasons of life in your past where you've, you've felt that way, or maybe there's something coming in the future, hope is the answer. And holding on to God's hope is, is what I want to talk about uh, today. In, in Psalm 46, it says this. This is a great promise from God. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And not only is he our ever-present help, but he is our ever-present hope. And so the question for you and me is, who do you turn to? 
What do you do? What is your reaction? What is your mindset? Who do you trust when you're walking through difficult times? Is God your ever-present help? Is he your ever-present hope? He is your strength. Is he your refuge? And I know in my, my own life, there's been times where I feel like I turn to the wrong things to try to get me through a tough time. And yet I will say over and over again, when I have turned my thoughts and my mind and my actions to the ever-present hope of God, it delivers every time. It really does. In Isaiah 46, it says this, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. Maybe you're going through a week right now or a month right now where you're like, I can't even move. I can't even walk right now. I feel like I am powerless. He says, I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. That is an amazing promise, isn't it? And sometimes it's verses like that, is that when in our darkness, in our despair, in our depression, in our hopelessness, we can turn to that. We can look to stories in the Bible over and over again how God showed up in the midst of lots of confusion, in the midst of lots of questions that we might have. The question of, am I going to make it? Am I going to get through? Is it going to be okay? God over and over and over again delivers and says, I am your strength. I am your refuge. I will rescue you. I am your ever-present help. I am your ever-present hope. That's what he tells us and communicates to us in his scripture. And and one of the things that I think is just so important to remember, and if you're in one of these seasons right now where it's tough and there's fear and you're not sure, this is what I, I've, I've learned this in my own life and my own story. The, probably the person sitting next to you has learned this in their, in their story too. And certainly God's word says this, that God's promise is more powerful than our problems. And he made you a promise, a, a promise to, to prosper you. He's got a plan. He's got a good story for you. This doesn't end in tragedy. It doesn't have to. But holding on to hope, holding on to his promises are absolutely key to the equation. If you want to get through it, it's not only just sort of showing up each day, but it is holding on to this powerful thing called God's Hope And hope to me is about the ideas and energy that we, we have for the future that help us today. Hope is the promises of God. It's trusting that he is for you, that he is with you, that, that he hasn't abandoned you in your suffering. And he hasn't abandoned your friends and he hasn't abandoned your family members who are suffering right now. That he is there with us in all of it. And I think there's probably a lot to be said that God is even closer to us in those seasons of doubt, in those seasons of hardship. I love what author Eugene Peterson says about hope. He says this, hope means a confident, alert expectation that God will do what he said he would do. It is imagination put in the harness of faith. It is the willingness to let God do it his way and in his time. And that's the problem, isn't it? That we have to allow God to do it his way and in his time. Because if it was up to me, Mike Foster, I would handle things a lot differently. I'd say, God, let's get through this. Let's get to this. Let's get to the solution-based stuff right now because this season sucks. I don't like this. And God, I've got three easy steps for my life that I, is going to help me move through this, this uh, uh, problem, through this relationship challenge, through this, this financial issue. Like, just give me three easy steps. And he goes, no, no. That's not the way I work, Mike. I do a little differently. Sometimes I take my time. Sometimes it's a little messy and kind of ups and downs and it's a little different than what you thought it would look like. 
How many of you can relate to that? It looks a little bit different than you thought it was going to look. And, and, and here's our kind of response. Like we, when you're facing challenges, when you're facing problems, there's, there's sort of positives and negatives. And I think there's three different types of people that show up in these situations. Number one, there'd be the, the angry cynic, right? And the angry cynic does what? He focuses on all the negatives, everything that's wrong, why it won't work, why even try, see how horrible the world is. It's the angry cynic. How many of you are angry cynics? Raise your hand. Just kidding. Don't do that. Here's what I say. If you were going to raise your hand, you don't have to live this way. And then, okay, so here's the angry cynic focusing on all these negatives, right? Ignoring all the positives, but no, focus right there. And then we have what I'd call the, oh, let's call them the foolish optimist. And what do they do? Some of you are like, oh, that's me. Uh, foolish optimist. I'm just going to focus on only the positives, no negatives in my life. Rainbows and unicorns and kids on outstanding child uh, programs and kids hitting home runs all the time and my marriage is perfect. And I show up to church every single Sunday. I sing songs beautifully all the time and God has answered every single question in my life so absolutely clearly I can only focus on the positives. Don't bring any of this into the situation. We don't need to go here. I don't do negatives. It's only this optimism, foolish optimist. Some of you fall into that category. But here's what I'm inviting you into. I'm going to give you a new title, a new role, a new uh, uh, name for you. And, that's, and I made this up, but I like it. I, I want you to be hopesters, okay? <laughs> they pay me a lot of money to come up with words like that. I got to tell you. No, I'm just kidding. I want you to be a hopester. And what does a hopester do? A hopester, well, he welcomes the positives and sees the positives and is reaching for uh, things of light and, and the promises of God, but is not ignoring either the negatives. Yeah, life is kind of hard sometimes. Yes, there is suffering in the world. And, and a hopester can hold all of that. Can, can, a hopester can trust that yeah, God knows what he's doing. A, a hopester can hold the, the messiness of life, but, but a hopester doesn't, sort of isn't defined by just the negative and isn't just you know, defined by the positive. It's all there mixed in the middle in this messy state called hope. And that's what we are. As Christ followers, we're hopesters. We don't ignore the negative. We don't ignore the suffering. We don't pretend that life is supposed to be just super peachy all the time. We don't pre pretend that just because we're Christians that all of a sudden we don't have relationship issues or, or personal problems or financial struggles. No, but we live in this place called hope and we show up each day for our friends and our communities and our families and our workplaces as hopesters because we have the promises of God. And it's real, and, and, and you've experienced it, I've experienced it. And so there's two things that, that over, the, over my own journey with, with being a hopester have become so self-evident about who God is. And number one, it's this, that God uses a wide angle lens when looking at the picture of your life. See, he sees everything, big wide angle. I got one of those new iPhones the iPhone uh, uh, camera on there has this new feature where it's like super wide. I don't know, anybody got the new iPhone? It's, it's awesome. And it's so cool because all of, I was back there taking pictures this morning. And all of a sudden, the auditorium goes from like this to like this. It looks like we got 10,000 people in here. It's incredible. But it's like it goes from this picture to the super wide. And all of a sudden, so much more detail and so much more, more information comes in. And that's God's perspective. And yet you and I, we look at it through the microscope. We're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get through this storm. I'm not going to get through this moment. 
This is our picture. It's a microscopic look. And God says, I'm a wide angle God. I'm looking at all of it. I see your past. I see your present. I see your future. And it's going to be a good picture. Also, <laughs> I've learned about God that God is more interested in the process than the finish line. And that really frustrates me. Because what he does through our suffering and through our hurt and through the things that don't go right in your life and the pain that you've experienced and the trauma that you have walked through is that God uses all of that stuff to take us through this process of, of revealing new levels of, of his love and his care for us of us beginning to understand certain things about who we are and what we're made of. And that God is certainly interested in the finish line, but he's really interested in the process of who he's making you into and who you're becoming, not just through the mountaintop experiences, but through those valleys and through the struggle. And so we embrace all of it and say, this is a process, and again, if we were to design the process, it would probably look a lot different, huh? And it would move a lot faster. And we'd get to that finish line and that victory and that, that conclusion a lot faster than God does. But hope says, and that ever-present hope says that I'm gonna trust the process. I'm gonna show up each and every day and work it, even when it's hard even when you wanna give up, even when you wanna quit on your story, even when you say, this is just too much to handle. We hold on to hope. I love what uh, Psalms 126 says. It says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. And some of you right now are, are really hurting. And, and you, you had a tough month, maybe a tough week. Maybe this has just been a season of turmoil for you. And, and I wanna promise you, and, and because I've experienced it and the people in this, many of the people in this room have experienced it, and because God promises us this, that, that that sorrow, that pain can turn to a song of joy. But it means trusting God's promise of what he says about your situation and your story. It's working that process. You know, um, one of the things that I believe is so absolutely important when it comes to this idea of hope is how hope sits in the middle of our grief and our sadness. When there is irreplaceable loss in our lives that we can bring hope into that place. And, and as Americans, as Westerners in general, we don't like to talk about death or loss or things that are not coming back. And so we just, again, we're kind of that foolish optimist. We just kind of suck it up and move on. And, and yet God invites us into grieving those things that are never coming back in our lives because he knows that, that hope is the sustainer through those seasons. He, he invites us to feel all the feelings of grief and loss. And man, I, I gotta tell you, like grief is sort of like an all-you-can-eat buffet of emotions, right? It is sadness, it is depression, it is anger, it is confusion, it is all of that stuff just mixed together. So what are some things that maybe we should grieve or that you need to grieve in your life and then invite hope to be a part and a center of it? Number one, Things that we should grieve, broken relationships. Maybe there's some broken relationships in your story and in your past right now, or maybe even currently, that you need to begin to grieve that, to grieve that loss. Maybe that person that hurt you or betrayed you. Maybe that person that's no longer in your life and you want them to be in your life, but they just decided to end the friendship or the relationship. We need to grieve that, and we need to work through the emotions of that, but yet hold on to hope in the middle of that grief. Some of us need to grieve who we used to be. Some of us right now are struggling with, with medical issues and our bodies are, are maybe failing us and aren't working the way we want them to. And we're like, I just wanna go back to being that person. 
that person with a strong body or a strong, strong mind, or, or maybe there's pieces of you and your story that, that you look back and you're like, I, I wish I was that person, and you're no longer that person. And so you need to grieve that. And grieve the, 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 the loss of maybe what you knew in those seasons and in those days. Some of us need to uh, grieve some of the mistakes that we've made. We look back on our story and, and it just makes us sad and we're trying to change things and we wish things were different and choices that we made and like, why did I do that? Oh my gosh, I wish I, some of us just need to begin to release that by grieving that. And some of us this morning are just need to grieve uh, death and, and the loss of people that we, we have loved. Maybe you've lost a family member, a friend, a mom, a dad. And I don't care whether it's recent or 20 years ago. Most of us don't grieve. Most of us don't work that process because it's so hard. And, and again, we have to feel all those feelings. And it feels so hopeless and so dark. And there's just that irreplaceable loss. Like, what? I don't want to go there, God. And God invites us into that. He says, if you trust me to grieve that and to feel that and to hold on to my ever-present help and my ever-present hope, I will, I will see you through. Now, I think sometimes um, there's messages that I, I get to preach and teach where uh, it, it's, it's for you. And some, some messages, it's for you and me. But I think, you know, this morning is at some level Mike Foster is preaching to Mike Foster. Jared told me, uh, he said, hey, it's an open weekend, talk about whatever you want. I said, you know what, I need to talk about hope because I, Mike Foster, need this message and maybe you can relate to this at some level too. So uh, I have a couple friends, uh, Jared and Julie Wilson, great friends of mine, amazing people. Uh, I've known Jared since he was 19 years old and he, he was just, just this amazing guy, and Julie, his wife, is incredible. And I got a, I got a text from uh, Julie four weeks ago. And it was one of those texts that you don't want to get in the morning. And uh, so a month ago, Julie texted me, and she said that Jared uh, had died by suicide the night before, Jared Wilson. And, um, you know, I'm looking at myself, and I'm like, this, this isn't real. This, this can't be happening right now. Not, not Jared Wilson. Not my friend. Not the friend I've known for 19 years. Jared was a, an advocate for mental health and, and had struggled with, with depression in his own life and yet was this, this incredible, encouraging voice to thousands of people, helping them through their struggle. And I'm, I, I'm reading this text and just weeping, going, no, God, don't let this be true. And I, uh, I remember talking to Julie that day and just uh, sitting and hearing and just going like, no, no. God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And uh, I gotta be honest, like, the past four weeks of just beginning to, to mourn and to grieve the loss of my friend is, it's been hard. I, I, uh, I feel deflated. I, I, it's it's kind of where I saw my wife, Jennifer, I'm like, I, I can't even return an email on some days. Like, that feels overwhelming. And that's honestly, friends, that's what grief looks like. It's, in, in I, I was telling Jen, I'm like, I don't even understand it. Because I, I had, I loved Jared. I cared about Jared. Jared, we didn't get to spend a lot of time recently together, but we had touch points along, you know, the 10 plus years that I knew him. And, um, you know, it wasn't that we were like, you know, my, he wasn't my best friend. And yet he's a friend and there's a loss in my heart. And I don't even understand why it feels the way it feels right now, but it feels this way. And so I'm working the process and I'm trusting God and I'm holding on to the ever-present hope because that's all I got right now because I want to change some things about what happened with Jared. I, I, want, to, I want to 
change history. I want to rewrite that past. I want Jared back, right? And some of you have relationships and people in your life where you feel the same way, like, I want them back. I've, I am heartbroken. I am sad. And so God says, hey, I'm going to be with you in those moments. And he has been. You know, one of the things that have been, has been so helpful to me um, during the past month is just listening to worship music. Now, I don't really listen to a lot of worship music, but I have just been listening to these songs and these promises of God's word and just kind of getting, having my mind meditating in those truths. You know, it's also been helping is hanging out with people and friends who encouraged me. Because sometimes I think that grief, kind of the process, it looks like this. When it first starts out, it just feels like this big, heavy weight. And uh, we'll just have this, like this suitcase is full of all the heaviness of these moments. And uh, by the way, you go, well, Mike, uh, looks like grief has wheels on it and a nice little handle. And wouldn't it be awesome if we could just drag it around like that, but we can't. You know how we handle grief? This is how we handle it. And we carry it, and it is heavy. And it's going to be heavy. And I can't change that. And honestly, God can't change that. But God does promise us hope when it's heavy. And sometimes we're carrying it this way. and like, okay, I'm getting kind of used to the heaviness. I can figure this out. And then sometimes it's over our head, and we're like, oh, my gosh, it feels really heavy now. You just keep showing up and doing the work and working through the emotions and feeling the pain and being angry and bargaining with God and it gets a little, grief gets a little bit smaller. And then, we, then it turns into a backpack and there's still some weight to it and some heaviness to it. And those emotions are still there. You're having more good days than bad days, but you still feel the weight of it. That's a little bit and I don't know how, here's the other thing, I don't know how long you're going to have to carry it like this. I don't know how long you're going to have to carry it in the big suitcase. But you keep holding on to hope. And then I think eventually grief looks like this little, fills this little fanny pack. So grief allows you to make a real incredible fashion statement in front of people. <laughs> and you kind of wear it this way. And, and you keep doing the work and maybe you're going to counseling and maybe you're leaning into friends and you're meditating on God's word and you're, 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 the life is starting to come back into to life. And you're like, okay, I, I'm, I'm alive again. I'm feeling joy again. I'm feeling free again. It's like, oh, I, I've done my work. I'm gonna take grief off and I'm gonna go ahead and just put it over there. And I'm like, no, nope, that's not the way it works, is it? Because here's the reality. I'm never getting over Jared. I'm never getting over the loss of my friend. And you're never getting over that relationship that hurts you so deeply. And you're never getting over the loss of that child. And you're never getting over certain things in your story and you're gonna carry it, but you're gonna carry it with hope. You're gonna carry it with God's strength. You're gonna carry it with the promise that says, I, he is your refuge. He is your rescuer. He is your strength. That's what grief looks like. But work the process. Lean into God's hope. I, uh, my wife and my family, uh, I mentioned this uh, a couple months ago, but we went to uh, Yosemite for our family vacation, and it was pretty cool. I'd never been there, and... and uh, one of the things about Yosemite, how you enter Yosemite Valley is you have to go through this, this very long tunnel. It's actually the longest tunnel in California. And so you drive into this tunnel and it is dark and it is narrow and it is this pure granite and rock and it's a one lane that way and one lane going the other way and you're, you're driving through it and it's long and it's dark and you can't even see the end of this tunnel. But you just keep driving and going. You're like, all right, I hope we're going the right way here. Hope this is gonna 
uh, turn out the way I think it's going to turn out. And you know what happens as you drive through this mile-long tunnel, dark, narrow, hopeless tunnel? As you come out, you start seeing a little bit of the light at the end. You're like, okay, we're getting close, we're getting close. And as your car keeps getting closer to the light, all of a sudden you come out of the tunnel. And this is the picture right there. That is exactly what you see as you come out of the longest tunnel in California. You see the valley. You see the beauty. It all becomes worth it. Like we're here. And maybe right now, your life feels like you're in a tunnel. Or maybe right now, you know people that are in a tunnel. And maybe we need to grab hold of hope for our own lives, and maybe we need to help our friends grab hope for theirs. And so as we take a couple moments and DJ and the team sing uh, this song over us, I want you to think about how you might invite hope into those sad, hard places right now. How might you invite hope into your grief? How might you invite the ever-present hope into your story that feels like so confusing right now? How might you be hope for a family member or a friend or a neighbor? What might that look like? Let's just take a couple moments as a community to invite hope into that place.